Let me let me start in uh, with the, with our panel uh, on how PPPs can boost economic recovery. Um, and we are in a region that has been facing uh, different challenges. Uh, the pandemia have uh, put our region in a in a in a new fiscal situation, uh, and also facing a very big infrastructure gap. Uh, that need to be addressed in order to reach the sustainable development goals. Uh, in this context, we, we, we believe that uh, being able to invest in infrastructure and keep up our capital stocks will be key for economic recovery. I'm here today with a very, very uh, prestigious panel, um, Mr. Uh, Minister Alison West from Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, since August 2022 is in, the, in, in charge of the Minister of Public Administration. Uh, Minister West has an extensive background and experience in the field of tax and corporate services. She was partner at the Land and Tax Leader uh, and Tax Corporate Services at the Department of PricewaterhouseCoopers in Trinidad and Tobago and has been involved in the formulation of tax policy and drafting relevant legislation uh, and has made submissions to the Supreme Court of Trinidad and Tobago. Minister Wurst uh, has been recognized as a leading figure in the field of taxation and uh, had played a key role in the country's public service. Thank you very much, Minister, for being with us today. A special Representative uh, Dorothy uh, McLaugh from the U.S. State Department uh, is in charge uh, and leading the structure and public-private partnerships to advance national security and foreign policy priorities of the U.S. government. A special representative McLaugh, uh, building PPPs to achieve policy objectives uh, in technology, innovation, economic development, energy transition, and um, other topics. Thank you very much for being with us today. Secretario Marcos Calvacanchi, uh, muito obrigado uh, por participar nesse painel. Secretário, secretário do, do Programa de Participação Público-Privada do Brasil. Uh, é um parceiro uh, chave da, 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 do, do BID uh, e também uh, tem a responsabilidade do Programa PPP do Governo Federal do Brasil. Muito obrigado pela participação no nosso painel. Let me let me go forward with a, a, a brief of the introduction of the of the context in which we are uh, operating. Latin America and the Caribbean is, are facing a big infrastructure gap. Um, it's not only reflected by the lack of infrastructure or the lack to access to infrastructure services, but also uh, a poor quality in the infrastructure services around the region. Um, Achieving the sustainable uh, development goals by 2030 will demand a, a very large investment, but also keeping up with the maintenance and operation of the existing infrastructures. Uh, as you may know, the, the investing in infrastructure has a, a big multiplying effect in the economy. Uh, our calculations indicate that uh, investing in infrastructure could generate uh, an increase in GDP of roughly 1% of the GDP every year. And most importantly, not investing enough in, in, in infrastructure has a, a very negative effect on growth. Uh, and this effect is also even worse if uh, there is a cumulative non-investment, which can, could reach until uh, up to 15% of the GDP. So not investing enough for a decade in PPPs, in infrastructure, I'm sorry, could have a very negative effect on the economy of the countries. In this scenario, the, we believe that uh, the region has uh, a, a two important challenges. One of them is how to better use their public investment and to be more efficient in public investment in infrastructure. And, and two, how to mobilize and attract private capital on key areas of the infrastructure sector to be able to expand and optimize the investment from, for the countries. Let's start uh, with Minister West. From, um, I would like to say that from, from the IDB uh, group, it's, a, it's, it's really an honor to be able to partner with the government of Trinidad and Tobago uh, in the structuring of the Port of Spain PPP, which we are starting. Uh, we would like to hear uh, from you um, how this project is aligned with the National Development Strategy 2016-2030, 
uh, and improving productive quality, uh, uh, productivity through the quality of infrastructure and transportation. Thank you, Gaston. Even as we went into lockdown for the COVID-19 pandemic, the Prime Minister realized that our greater challenge would be not surviving the pandemic, but recovering from the pandemic and coming out stronger. So he set up this committee to come up with a plan to bring us out of the pandemic and make Trinidad and Tobago stronger. They met with various, the committee was comprised of people from the public sector, the private sector, academia, and the labor. And we met with all sectors to determine what needed to be done. And in meeting with the private sector, they pointed us to two main things. One was um, expediting the digitalization of the economy, and the other one was fixing the port of Port of Spain. Now, when we looked at that, we realized that the government, either directly or through its agency, had been operating the port for a long time without bringing the kinds of efficiencies that we needed. So we thought that it would be better to take a different approach and go with the PPP. So we formed a subcommittee of cabinet, which I lead to promote this project. We engaged the IDB, which did a pre feasibility study for us and indicated that yes, it was a viable option for a PPP. So now we are working closely with them to come up with the right partner. What we are hoping to do is find the type of investor who would relieve the government of the need to find capital and remove capital from other areas of the economy that we need to invest in to support the port, not only to continue with its operations, but to expand it. So for example, we have the opportunity to expand the port to accommodate Panamax vessels, which we don't currently do. And that is one of the things we're hoping that an investor can do. It will, if we get the right partner, it, will, it works well for everybody. It relieves the government of the burden of operating the port. It hopefully provides profits for the partner. It supports our manufacturing sector to become more efficient, to get cheaper goods into the country, and to expand the exports out because we have a very viable manufacturing sector, but they need that support in order to expand the way they want to expand. And of course, it helps the country to improve on its diversification through increased manufacturing. So we are really hopeful that working with the IDB, which has been lending really um, important support to find the right partner to get us there. And it does impact our um, strategic goals in improving our infrastructure for greater efficiency for the development of the country. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, Minister West. Now, now moving on to uh, Special Representative McLaughlin. Um, uh, in a broad sense, America has uh, uh, a private-private partnership at the core of its nature. Um, in this context, what can you tell us about working with the private sector to address uh, our challenges and how you see uh, P3s contributing to the efficient and sustainable development in the region? Well, thank you, it's an honor to be here. I appreciate the IDB for inviting me, especially my US Executive Director, uh, Fabiana Jorge. Thank you uh, for the work you're doing and Gaston, very important work here and to be on the stage with the Minister and the Secretary is an honor. So P3s are a really important tool, long recognized by the U.S. State Department and U.S. government. Uh, our office has been in, uh, in, office, uh, in place since for about 14 years now and leveraged uh, $4 billion and 1,600 partnerships over that time. So it certainly is a commitment of the U.S. State Department to work with the private sector. I think um, government has to be, to recognize uh, with humility that uh, we must be more nimble, we have to be innovative, and we have to uh, be humble and recognize that we need the private sector to achieve our national security, foreign policy goals, and to um, help address our uh, solutions, find solutions to our shared global challenges. Um, so we have some innovative tools, and we were talking earlier, our office, we 
we work with uh, on both economic infrastructure and social uh, infrastructure challenges, um, climate, energy security, gender equity, democracy, all of the things we feel are very important to uh, uh, shared prosperity, which brings peace in the world. And that's really our ultimate goal at the United States State Department. And um, I'm really honored to, to be working on behalf of this administration with uh, President Biden and Secretary Blinken, um, who really see the private sector uh, as an amplifier and an accelerator to achieve our, our good work um, and our efforts. We in my office have uh, led these partnership opportunity delegations. It's a, a tool we've refined to bring private sector along with us as we travel within regions, especially just finished a partnership opportunity delegation that we took to Bogota and San Jose uh, around 5G cybersecurity. We were, I had a, with me Ambassador Fick, it's a new ambassador level at the State Department. His position is cyberspace and digital policy. He's the ambassador at large for those that sector. And really engaging private sector, both multinational companies, U.S. companies, um, small and large and medium-sized companies, which I think is important to bring them uh, together with our embassies on the ground who have the economic lay of the land, but also to meet with ministers of those countries to, to really identify early on what are the needs and the uh, opportunities, uh, both for the country uh, that we're visiting and, and trying to work through P3s, uh, as well as for the private industry folks. And I think having these early conversations um, at that high level really help uh, with the problem solving and, and beginning early is the key in terms of understanding what the mutual needs are, right? We know private sector um, has, a, has a specific interest. They're, they have goals in mind and where we can make alignment with the government's interests uh, and for the citizens of the country uh, with our support, that's what we aim to do. So that was a very successful uh, example of the kinds of things we're doing. We've also led one to Ghana around climate entrepreneurship and incubating and accelerating entrepreneurs on the ground in, in Ghana. Um, and also we did one uh, to the Western Balkans in the face of energy security challenges because of the war in Ukraine, Russian's aggression to, on Ukraine. Uh, countries in that region are having to redirect supplies um, and find security through energy in other ways. And we also want to support the tra clean transition as well. So the energy transition away from oil, Russian oil. So uh, the really, I guess it's a long way of saying we are we try to be flexible, innovative, and, and find the experts where we can. We're really, our office focuses on how do we drive P3s to advance foreign policy goals and national security. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see a lot of, uh, a lot of complementarity and, and, and common, common priorities here with the region, region that is uh, also transitioning on energy uh, and a sector that is mostly run by the private sector. Uh, so I, I can see that, that it will be a lot of, a lot of common areas to, to collaborate on that. Thank you very much. Uh, agora, passando com você, secretário Calvacanti, o, o Brasil não é apenas o maior mercado de toda a região, não? Certamente um dos mais ativos e, e, e eu diria sofisticado por nível de, 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 dos contratos PPP, das áreas, dos setores que têm sido envolvidos. Além disso, de acordo a nosso, a nosso estudo eh, que fazemos com, com The Economist Impact, Infrascópio, eh, o Brasil também vem avançando muito na, na qualidade eh, institucional e regulatória nos últimos anos, colocando-se assim eh, no, no top do, do ranking junto com o Chile. Não? Eh, então, eh, nesse ambiente bem mais sólido, eh, eh, do, do, dos aspectos institucionais, do planejamento dos projetos APPs. Eh, nesse contexto, secretário, quais são os, os, as lições que você pode compartilhar com, com, com o restante da região sobre as melhores práticas que levaram o Brasil -se a posicionar como líder regional? O que você pode nos dizer sobre as particularidades do ambiente regulatório brasileiro e a implementação das PPPs a nível federal? É, primeiro, agradecer ao BID e seu nome, Gastão, pela participação aqui no evento, e dizer que o Brasil tem essa representatividade por um fator de tempo. No final da década de 80, início da década de 90, do século passado, 
o Brasil passava por uma crise financeira, inclusive de não pagamento da dívida externa enorme. E, naquele momento, foi opção do governo brasileiro, inclusive anterior à primeira lei de concessões e PPPs no, PPPs no Brasil, de modo geral, que foi no ano de 1995, o Brasil partiu para os, chamar o setor privado para que fizesse os investimentos necessários, e o que o setor privado avançou, ou o setor que avançou inicialmente, foi o setor elétrico, que hoje 100% do setor elétrico brasileiro, desde a sua geração, distribuição a, até a transmissão, é feito pelo setor privado. E, com isso, a gente começou a adquirir uma experiência na, na vida real, inclusive anterior à elaboração da lei de concessões. Então, nós começamos por uma crise financeira, que levou com que a gente partisse para esse modelo de parceria por privada, inicialmente no setor elétrico e depois avançando naturalmente nos setores de infraestrutura, mobilidade urbana, estradas, portos e, e aeroportos. E, pelo tamanho do Brasil, com 27 estados subnacionais e 5.500 municípios, mesmo no momento que, por razões administrativas e ou ideológicas, o processo de PPP não, não andou dentro do governo federal, em determinado momento, os entes subnacionais avançaram. Então, nós passamos a ter um pipeline de casos de PPPs que fez com que a gente fosse aprendendo por experiências dos estados, do município e de casos da União. E o ambiente regulatório foi avançando também. A, a reação da própria estrutura administrativa dos do nossos colegas servidores públicos, inicialmente, não é muito favorável a isso, porque nós estamos mexendo em algumas estruturas estabilizadas. Os órgãos de controles internos e externos também, inicialmente, passam a ter uma nova forma, um novo tipo de contrato que eles têm que auditar, que não é o que eles estavam estruturados há 50 anos, há 30 anos antes desse modelo de contratação. Então, nós avançamos nisso com, com alguma muita dificuldade em alguns momentos, outros momentos mais fáceis, e as crises têm ajudado também que a gente perceba as diferenças. O Brasil, novamente, passou por uma crise. Hoje, o Brasil tem um, uma estrutura de chamada de, de planejamento fiscal, que garante um superávit, mas também inibe a capacidade de gastos do poder público, recuperado um pouco agora nesse segundo mandato do presidente Lula. Mas também a gente precisa avançar por esse investimento. E surgiu uma ponta que a gente vê falando, e eu estou aqui nesses, desde ontem ouvindo, a gente foca muito a área de infraestrutura nas PPPs. Mas eu vejo as PPPs como a evolução da forma do poder público prestar os serviços à sociedade. É, inicialmente, por crises financeiras e fiscais do poder público, nós partimos para as concessões, mas a prestação de serviço de saúde, educação, é, manejo florestal, parques, transporte, todos esses fatores passam a ter uma prestação de serviço melhor por índice de desempenho mais fácil de ser aferido e, principalmente, na área de serviço público, a continuidade da prestação de serviço, porque nós não ficamos sujeitos a ciclos de períodos eleitorais para que aquele, aquele setor seja valorizado ou não. Não se faz investimento a longo prazo em nenhum lugar sem a garantia da continuidade. Então, essas contratações de PPPs, esse aviante avanço, os órgãos de controle, e no caso do Brasil, nós temos os tribunais de contas, avançaram muito, e mais recentemente até o Tribunal de Contas da União criou um organismo que é o chamado de controvérsias. Antes de você submeter um processo ao Tribunal de Contas e ser julgado, punido ou não, você pode ir para o tribunal junto com o setor privado, participando também da discussão, e você encontrar uma solução de consenso para que facilite que a gente continue com o projeto é, em desenvolvimento. Muito obrigado, secretário, por, por a resposta tão completa. Eu acho que, que, que aí é, a gente tem um, um, um... Você deu um ponto muito interessante, que é o centro da involucramento do setor privado, que ele tem que é, entregar qualidade de serviço e, e essa, essa, essa repartição, alocação do, das funções públicas e privadas para melhorar também a qualidade do serviço de infraestrutura. Muito obrigado. Coming, coming back to, to you, Mr. West, uh, 
I, I would like to, to, to ask you, what are the challenges and opportunities that Trinidad and Tobago present going forward in terms of economic and social infrastructure? And how do you see collaboration with the private sector helping to promote economic development in the country? Okay, so we have two really important challenges. And they are one, because Trinidad and Tobago has been an oil-based economy for the last four or five decades, we have become, become dependent on that source of income, which has done two things. It has not steered us towards diversification at the speed that we need to, to be. And also, it has made the government very involved in providing services and support to the population. So we, have, we are at a place where the population is expecting the government to be all things to all people. And with reducing energy revenue, that is becoming more and more challenging. Secondly, because again, the government has been in receipt of fairly reasonable revenues from the energy sector, we have not focused sufficiently on efficiencies. And so we are involved in a lot of areas, but we don't do a lot of them efficiently. There are lots of things that we do that can be operated as effective businesses that we need to start divesting to the public sector because it is my view that the government should really focus on being a facilitator and let businessmen run businesses so that we have profitable businesses, efficient businesses, and the country runs more smoothly while the government spends less funds on those activities and retains its funds for more important things. In terms of opportunity, we have a wealth of them. For example, Trinidad and Tobago is ideally located south of the hurricane belt. And so we are in a sheltered area, ideal for shipping. So marine activity, we should be getting involved in setting up marinas for international things. We are currently looking at offering bunkering facilities for cruise ships. We are talking about um, creating a bunkering and repair facility for Panamax vessels coming through the area, heading to South America, and those kinds of opportunities. There's health, there's education. Um, we have been involved in PPP survey in the energy sector, and they have worked well. So if we can transfer the, uh, the learnings from those, and hopefully the learnings we'll get from this port PPP into those other areas where the opportunities are so significant, I think we would put Trinidad and Tobago in a very good position, help us with, with our diversification thrust, and move us into a place where we're ready to, to go forward and grow from strength to strength. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, um, Minister, Mr. West. Now, now moving, moving back to you, uh, Special Representative McLeod, uh, I, I would like to, to, um, to ask you, um, how, how do you see the solutions for, uh, for climate change and critical sustainable uh, development and growth economies? In your opinion, how can PPPs facilitate the implementation of these solutions? Part. The second. second part is how, how you see the PPPs both for uh, sustainable development yes. and, and, and climate yeah. change. Well, um, certainly, as I said before, private sector is going to be key to the innovation, the technology that we need to address this global, very global challenge that we're all feeling in this moment exactly uh, with this, the, the heat we're all experiencing right now in our oceans and in our countries. Um, we have a platform which we've created, the Coalition of Con uh, uh, Climate Entrepreneurs, where we have invited the large, um, large companies to engage on a platform with um, climate entrepreneurs, startups in emerging, in emer in emerging economies. Um, so putting this network together where we can offer um, opportunities to find capital, to develop skills, to uh, opportunities to, to sell products. Um, so building this coalition of large and small to come together to help lift up uh, the innovations within um, our communities around the global south and, uh, and, and across the, the globe, honestly. Um, we feel this is a really important piece of lifting up economies as well as finding solutions to our climate challenges. 
And I think that for, not forgetting that, you know, as we solve these problems and challenges, we're formalizing uh, workforce and job opportunities for uh, citizens of the world. And so I am very, we've created a fund to help uh, with startup and acceleration for entrepreneurs and always looking to the private sector to help us support. We also signed an MOU with the International Trade ITC to help also create another platform where smaller entrepreneurs and startups and small business, medium-sized business can actually market their uh, sustainable goods and certifications to larger companies who are trying to source um, from, from uh, sustainable uh, uh, businesses. So, I think we have to be creative. I think we have to uh, talk to each other and continue to work together to, to find ways that we can collaborate. And so those are just a few examples, but uh, there are so many P3s going on here in Panama as well. Uh, the Water Project is one, and the uh, my embassy team is here. I want to acknowledge the work they're doing around um, power, PP3, uh, energy PP3s, the water project with the canal, with the Army Corps of Engineers and the, and the constitutional authority of the canal, uh, really critical to supply chain, to uh, moving goods, to safety and security for the region in terms of uh, the military uh, ability to use the canal as well and militaries to move, um, navies to move across the globe. So. Uh, I think it's the opportunities are endless as long as we're creative and we're continuing to communicate and work with the private sector to understand their needs as well. And I want to also say we have a very broad view of the private sector in our office. We, it, yes, it's very much business focused, but it's also academia. We work with academia for research and and, and development, uh, technology. Uh, we work with nonprofits and philanthropies as well who are looking to scale their impact, their social impact across the world. So, uh, as I said, there is no limit to the opportunity if we're all open-minded and, and, and willing to break out of our silos in government, especially, uh, is a, one thing government struggles with. But uh, there, there are those of us who see the, the future and the potential, and that's the, the work we're doing, and we're, we're proud of it. And I'm really honored to hear about the work you all are doing. Thank, thank you very much. I think uh, you, 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 you raised a, a very interesting point and, and, and very complimentary, uh, especially in the context of, of how uh, these kind of uh, contracts uh, can help the economic recovery, because these uh, emerging companies as providers or suppliers uh, of bringing innovation into the delivery of infrastructure services is, is key. And that's, that's where we see that the model can uh, uh, adapt and be more nimble, as you mentioned, uh, to, to an open to innovation. When we involve the private sector in the delivery of infrastructure, usually what we try is to uh, measure that through the, the, the quality of the delivery and not a command and control solution that will work against the innovation. So it's very interesting that how these small companies can, can find a niche there. And I think we talk about the challenges within these sectors. We always have to remember that at the root of it is, is people and communities and who we're trying to help lift up lives and livelihoods with creation of jobs. And that, I think, is a really important piece. The education, the workforce training opportunities, and then, uh, you know, good jobs for for these communities. Absolutely, that, that's that's that, that's another another good good point in the sense that those, especially for for the structure, the project finance structure of these deals, that will also require the the big company heading the the, the infrastructure project to formalize or, or to hire companies that are formal that pay the taxes and generate good quality jobs for, for, this, for the society. So that is also another, another common point there. Thank you very much. Agora moving uh, indo para você, secretário. Uh, o PPI desenvolveu cerca de 300 projetos entre 2016 e o ano passado, com investimentos superiores a 230 bilhões de reais. De, não, de dólares, desculpe. Uh, a taxas de concessões superiores aos 34 bilhões. O que você poderia nos dizer em termos de gerais sobre o impacto do desenvolvimento econômico desses projetos e os principais desafios que você identifica para o futuro? Oh, é, a carteira vai aumentar viu, na, próxima, na próxima década de investimentos. É, 
Nós avançamos muito na, na área, esses são os números aí das concessões federais e ou apoiadas por fundos federais na sua estruturação. Isso está fora todo o trabalho de subnacional, que é outro investimento muito, muito pesado. E falando para quem não conhece a administração brasileira, na saúde pública, por exemplo, a União não presta saúde pública direta. Quem presta, presta são os estados e municípios. Transporte de passageiros também é competência de estados e municípios. Então, nós avançamos muito. O governo federal, apesar de ter esses números, ele foi muito concentrado em algumas áreas, como energia, área de aeroportos e área de portos. É, nós estamos retornando o nosso pipeline agora para a área de infraestrutura rodoviária. Nós temos um desafio, porque as rodovias que são de características que elas possam se, serem, é, ter o retorno do seu investimento e seu custo de operação é, bancados pelas tarifas, já estão se encerrando pelo momento de tráfego. Então, nós temos um, um, um pipeline agora de cerca de 4 mil quilômetros, onde será necessário que o governo aporte recursos através de contraprestação e ou a pé, aporte para diminuir o CAPEX. Esse é um desafio para a gente estruturar essa, essas garantias. Mas fizemos isso para os subnacionais. Nós criamos uma estrutura que é a União da, da Garantia Soberana, aos fundos garantidores das concessões de subnacionais, das PPP subnacionais, e o um desafio é a gente ampliar a área de saneamento que eu vejo no momento. Nós, junto com o banco, acabamos de, de divulgar, há 30 dias atrás, um manual de estruturação de projetos de saneamento básico. É, assinamos contratos mais recentemente junto com o BNDES e a Caixa, que administra um outro fundo, Caixa Econômica Federal, onde nós vamos estruturar projetos para 11 milhões de brasileiros de resíduos sólidos, que é outra frente. E temos um pipeline aí de 8 bilhões de reais, aí aproximadamente 11 bilhões de dólares, 12 bilhões de dólares, em, em licitações que vamos fazer do setor de iluminação pública. Então, os desafios são principalmente a gente fazer na União, ou executar através da União, esses contratos de PPPs, na legislação brasileira é separada, PPP, onde é necessário o aporte de recursos públicos, que os subnacionais já fazem tranquilamente esse setor, mas a União tem uma dificuldade da estruturação das garantias. Muito, muito obrigado, secretário. Eu acho que a experiência do FEP, é, que você mencionou, da parceria com a Caixa e também as, as parcerias com o BNDES, são, acho que é um modelo de intervenção a nível federal para para incentivar e gerar um mercado subnacional do PPP tem sido muito bem sucedido para o Brasil e, e acho que, que, que fica uma, uma boa prática e um modelo para outros países de grande de grandes dimensões como, como, como o Brasil para implementar. É, estamos agora no segundo semestre lançando um, um outro fundo. Esse fundo vamos ter um outro tipo de administração. Nós estamos com aproximadamente aí dois, é, 200 bilhões de dólares e esse fundo nós contratamos uma entidade privada, uma instituição financeira privada, um consórcio entre instituições financeiras e escritórios, e ele será gerido por esse, por esse escritório. Então, nós vamos dar mais agilidade na contratação. Além dele permitir aporte de recursos do setor privado. O setor privado pode aportar diretamente nesse fundo e nós teremos aí mais uma forma de apoiar as estruturações de projetos. A, a, a gente conhecia alguma, alguma, alguma dessas ideias e achou muito, muito interessante e inovador. A gente tinha, tinha já trabalhado algumas ideias de uma PPP para estruturação, basicamente. Não? É, e, e acho que é um modelo, uma, uma modelagem muito, muito interessante, ainda porque pode optimizar os tempos e também mobilizar recursos para a etapa de pré-investimento, que é uma área bem desafiadora da região. Não? Então, Parabenizar para vocês por essa inovação também, secretário. I would like to close our, our panel to, with a, a, a small, a brief question as, as, as a follow-up. And, 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 and please, or, or even or a kind of a remark from every of you, so, so you can feel free to send the, the, last, the last message to the audience. Uh, Minister Allison uh, West, uh, what, what are the main challenges that you see for the sustainable development of uh, an economic growth of Trinidad and Tobago, and how is the government uh, thinking on the main lines of actions? Okay, so I think a main challenge we have, because the government is involved in so many areas of the economy, a 
key challenge that we have is the level of productivity. And I think to improve on that, if we move more towards the PPP projects and bring a more private sector approach to getting things done, that that will bring a significant improvement in the operations of the economy. So I've worked at both the private sector and the public sector. In the private sector, you determine I need X and I buy X. In the government sector, you have to go into procurement because you're spending public funds. It takes months to get anything done, and therefore that impacts on how quickly things move forward. That in turn impacts on how labor operates within the government service because they know the process is slow. So we really need to transform the economy from a public sector-based approach to a more private sector, efficient, results-oriented, profit-focused approach so that we can take advantage of all the many opportunities that Trinidad and Tobago has. So for example, we have identified several areas that we should be focusing on. For example, we are currently in traditional energy activity, but we have talked about moving towards carbon capture, for example, to make a more efficient energy, um, energy approach. But we haven't done anything about it. We don't have the capital, we don't have the expertise. So that I'm, I'm hoping that with the successful execution of this port project and demonstrating to the government and the country that public-private partnerships work well and can benefit the country, that we can come up with a program of proposed PPPs to move those initiatives from just thoughts on a drawing board to actual live activities that can benefit Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Special Representative uh, 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 McAuliffe, um, as, as in your position as a, uh, of, of head of the global partnerships, uh, how, how do you see the priorities either in the sectors or, or areas in the region in Latin America? What, what, what are your, your main priorities there? Oh, well, there are so many, that, let's be honest, in terms of global challenges that Latin America is facing along with many others. Um, but I think that we have to focus on certainly um, lifting up the economy through things like global food security, very important challenge, um, economic, the infrastructure we've been talking about, um, supply chain, uh, workforce. I, I really... Um, you know, the vice president has put together a private, public-private partnership around Latin America. So there, I, I want to underscore there is great um, interest and commitment to the region uh, by this administration. And what our responsibility is uh, as government is to show the private sector the opportunities uh, in Latin America where governments are interested and private sector also is interested in partnering. Um, and so it's really up to us to help um, lay the land, set the scene, uh, analyze with um, veracity uh, what real risk is. We talked about risk a little bit earlier and risk assessment and how can the government help uh, private sector understand what the, envir the business environment really is in a particular country. Um, and so those are the, those, that's the job we should be doing is to help uh, facilitate private sector finding the opportunities and partnerships uh, that are uh, serving the needs of the communities. But uh, if you wanted a list, Gaston, I think it would be very, very long <laughs> in terms of priority. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I didn't mean to have yeah, a list. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I know. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Secretary Secretary Cavacanchi, so, so pra, 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 pra fechar uh, o painel, é, eu, queria, eu queria dar uma última, uma última pergunta para você, de como você vê, o mais, uma, um jeito mais abrangente, o papel das PPPs na retomada econômica do Brasil? É, o, o Brasil vem de um ciclo de seis anos de redução a praticamente zero do investimento público direto. Eu vou dar um número para vocês, que o Ministério dos Transportes, teria para esse ano aproximadamente 9 bilhões de dólares para investir em 60 mil quilômetros de rodovias. O presidente eleito Lula, antes de se tomar posse, 
conseguiu negociar com o Congresso o que chamou a PEC é, da transição, onde conseguiu com o Congresso um espaço fiscal de 12 bilhões de dólares para investimento esse ano e uma permanência com aprovação do novo limite de despesa por os próximos anos nesse sentido. Mas são valores muito insuficientes para a dimensão do Brasil e a necessidade de infraestrutura. Com isso, nós estamos incentivando, dentro do governo federal, um grande número de parceria público-privada, criando esses três mecanismos, eu acrescento aí um quarto que o BID está apoiando, que é o Banco do Nordeste do Brasil, para que ele venha a ser estruturador de projetos, é, que a gente possa oferecer ao mercado, aos, aos subnacionais e à União, um pipeline de projetos ser estruturados nos próximos anos, e trabalhando na, garantia, na forma também de financiamento. É, nós estamos reduzindo o, o imposto sobre operação financeira em, em empréstimo do BNDES, é, nós estamos trabalhando na aperfeiçoando a legislação de debêntures incentivadas, aumentamos a possibilidade de debêntures incentivadas, isso é com isenção de impostos para as áreas sociais, e o Senado está aprovando, nesse próximo, quando retornar do recesso, uma legislação que vai permitir a emissão de, de debêntures incentivadas em moeda internacional. Com isso, a gente tem uma forma mais barata Lembrando aos que não são brasileiros que nós estamos hoje com a maior taxa real de juros do remuneração pelo Banco Central, 13,75%, com a inflação já anualizada e menos de 4%. Então, esse é um, um recurso que custa caro para investimento em infraestrutura, você carregar durante 20, 30 anos esta remuneração, além de aumentar o, o apetite do, do equity do, do acionista mas as medidas econômicas tomadas nesses últimos seis meses sinalizam para que o Banco Central, já agora no mês de agosto, comece uma diminuição na taxa de juros e que a gente possa, então, diminuir também o custo da, da, das nossos investimentos em, em PPPs. Outra orientação que foi dada pelo, pelo governo federal, está sendo dada pelo governo federal, é diminuir os apetites dos subnacionais, e no passado a União teve isso também, de que utilizar as PPPs como fonte arrecadatória. Então, é um, normalmente, quando a gente vê lá um leilão, né, no Brasil se faz muito leilão na Bolsa de Valores, e o julgamento do sucesso é quanto foi arrecadado pelo poder concedente. Essa arrecadação do poder concedente vai significar ou uma prestação de serviço pior ou uma tarifa mais, maior para a população. Então, nós temos que trabalhar na modicidade tarifária, e os dois leilões que nós estamos fazendo agora, por, de 4 mil quilômetros no estado do Paraná, representando investimento de 4 bilhões de dólares de CAPEX, tem esse modelo, onde a tarifa é reduzida e, a partir de determinado momento, neste caso, 18, acima de 18% de redução, ele tem que ter uma conta de reforço de equity. Então, o recurso não vai para o Tesouro e vai como uma conta de reserva para o projeto, que fica blindada para ser usada em caso de desequilíbrio. Então, essa perspectiva que a gente vê, o, 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 o Brasil é, chama o mercado, uma dificuldade que a gente tem de acesso de alguns players internacionais em vários setores. Alguns temos setores internacionais, né, como o setor de energia, como alguma parte do setor de aeroportos, basicamente empresas internacionais, mas em outros nós temos carências de players. O movimento do Brasil está sendo tão grande que nós temos dificuldade de estruturadores, de empresas para bidarem, como a gente diz, e até de, por, em função da destruição das grandes construtoras brasileiras pelas operações feitas pelo Poder Judiciário mais recente, nós não temos hoje construtoras com capacidade de carregar grandes capex de investimento e ter possibilidade de ter acesso seguro e performance para isso. Então, a possibilidade grande, a existência de, de menores concessões, de PPP de menor valores nos subnacionais e na União, permite a formação desses players, não só de construtores, mas também de, de investidores nesse setor, e que a gente possa suprir esse grande capacidade de necessidade que o Brasil tem de, de investimentos, não só do governo federal, 
mas como também dos subnacionais que estão muito ativos nessa área. Nós temos uma meta de saneamento até 2032, a gente tem um índice de universalização. E 2032 está aqui pertinho para que a gente possa fazer isso. Obrigado a todos aí pela, pela recepção. Muito, muito obrigado, secretário. I, I would like to, to close the, the, the panel with a, with, a, with a couple of conclusions from my notes. Uh, I would like to thank you all for the participation, um, Minister, Minister West, Special Representative McAuliffe. Um, I think we see here uh, 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 some common lines in the, in the importance of the private sector participation uh, to gain efficiency, innovation, uh, formal jobs, uh, and in some cases, like in, in, in Trinidad and Tobago, a big project coming in that could be the start of a new program and expanding to other sectors uh, to bring efficiency, mobilize capital, and with the ultimate goal to generate a better quality services for the, for, the, for the peoples of our country. So I would like to thank you all for the participation and, and please give a, a hand to everyone here. Thank you.